And the scribes, excuse me, first starting at verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and uttered them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself? That kingdom cannot stand. And if a house divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now I want you to back up to verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Talking about honor and shame and how an honor-shame culture is what the Bible culture is. In Bible times, personal identity was not yourself as an individual. It was about your group, who you belong to. And when survival is a number one concern, which it is, especially when there's famines and plagues and armies that could come against you at any time. It's better when you stick together. And so back then, families would stick together. Clans would stick together. And nations would stick together. And then your survival odds were maximized. Honor and shame is about belonging. Belonging to a group. And your most fundamental place to belong, both then and now, is your family. Your family is your most fundamental place to belong. You share DNA, you share appearance, you share experiences, locations, activities. Your family is where you belong the most. Family is our first and most important honor and shame group. It's the place where we learn what honor and shame is. You automatically belong to our family from the earliest stages of our development. We're automatically there. We have an innate need for our family's love and approval and acceptance. And we are shaped and molded by what our family values, what's important to our families. And today our families still fill that role. Even though we might not be an honor-shame culture, we still have families. And especially in this church, there's a, a lot of family that belongs to one another in this, this church. So this is especially relevant for us. We get our values, our honor and shame from our family. In Bible times, honor was held by families and inherited from ancestors. So in an honor-shame culture, the family that you come from kind of de- determines where you are going to belong and where your honor is. If you descended from somebody who was a traitor to your nation, that would bring dishonor upon not only that person who betrayed, but your entire family. By contrast, if you came from a Important family who saved the nation, say, from the family of David, then great things were expected of you. You were held in high honor by society. So my grandpa, who came from Greece, would often 
say things, well, often, from time to time, he would say things like, we are descended from Alexander the Great and from Aristotle because Alexander and Aristotle came from a similar area. So to claim that we are descended from them kind of raises our honor and we can expect great things from, from us. But you notice in the Bible that there's a lot of genealogies there. That, that's kind of lost on us in an individual culture, but for them, that showed who belonged to who. That showed who had what honor and shame. It kind of organized their whole society. And in two of the four Gospels, Jesus has a genealogy. And in both of them, it's really emphasized that Jesus comes from the line of David. Jesus is from David, so he has that honor. This is what we can expect from him. There were also prophecies about David that he would never cease to have someone sit on the throne. And Jesus, being the eternal king, was the ultimate fulfillment of of that. Every family has a set of values and therefore every family has a program of honor and shame. Whether we acknowledge it or not, whether it's subtle or overt, this is kind of how it works. In this passage here in Mark, this is what's going on. Jesus' mother and brothers were shamed by his erratic behavior. Jesus wasn't acting like a normal person in his family should act. And because of that, he was bringing shame on his family. And it was, it's so awkward, actually, that uh, in some of the ancient biblical manuscripts, it actually changes mother and brothers to say the scribes and the others. So like the Pharisees that were coming after him. But it says in John chapter 7 that even Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him, at least not at first. So they would be shamed by what he was doing. And rightly or wrongly, this applies to us as well, rightly or wrongly, families share each other's shame. We share each other's shame. We have, we as families or as as any kind of groups, but we belong to one another, and so what we do affects the others. My dad would tell you that his most embarrassing moment was when my sister was in the pool. She was maybe about six or seven or so, and we were at my grandparents' uh, apartment complex. They were the managers there, and there was an indoor pool there, so this was really cool. We could go swimming any time of the year. So we were there visiting, and uh, we were swimming, and my dad said, it's time to get out of the pool. And so I, you know, got out of the pool. You know, I'm usually the o- obedient kid. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. But my sister, Sarah, she uh, decided that this was going to be one of her moments of power struggle. She was in the middle of the pool. My dad was fully clothed on the side of the pool. And so she said, no, like one of those kids would do. Sarah, come on now. It's time to get out of the pool. No. (laughs) Middle of the pool. She's, what are you going to do about it, dad? So I remember being like, oh boy, this isn't going to be good. And so I, I, I took off. But my dad, the rest of the story is that my dad found one of those uh, life-saving hooks that they have. And so he goes to, from the corner and he's going to grab it and he's coming out. I'm going to get you, Sarah. And so he's going to hook, hook her and drag her to the side. But as he's about to do this, my grandma comes in being the manager of the building, and she's showing the building to somebody who's potentially going to be living there. And my dad is about to hook my sister in the pool there, and here comes my grandma with this, this uh, new family here. And my grandma looks and says, well, this is my son Greg and my granddaughter Sarah. And my dad is caught right there. He said that, my dad says that was one of his most embarrassing moments. 
So we have kids who shame the parents, and we have parents who shame kids. And that is kind of how families work. We embarrass one another. We carry each other's shame, and we share it. And the reason is because our families reflect on us and on our character, don't they? And our substance. And families will go to great lengths to protect their sense of honor. There's all kinds of families who have different kinds of secrets. And these are kept hidden because if they got out, it would be a source of shame. So for example... There would be a dad sleeping out on the front lawn. And uh, mom would say, well, daddy's camping out. When really he's passed out drunk. Or parents would say maybe to a child, you're so clumsy, always falling and hurting yourself. When really uh, the child's bruises are from a parent's angry beatings. Or a child might ask a parent, why aren't we happy at home when we are so happy at church? And the parents will answer, well, we are a good Christian family. We have some honor that we need to maintain. And we will deceive ourselves and keep secrets so that we can maintain that honor. This is what's going on here with Jesus and his family. Jesus is shaming his family because he is not being the son that he's supposed to be. And his family did not come to talk, but to seize him. Verse 21. They were coming to seize him. It's the same word in Greek that they use for arrest. When somebody's being placed under arrest, that's what his family wanted to do. They were going to snatch him and drag him home. Make him behave. Use honor and shame to get him back in line. That house divided against itself cannot stand. That's what's going on here. Jesus was a traveling preacher and healer. He wasn't staying at home, so he broke the family unit. Jesus trusted his father for guidance, his provision, his direction. He didn't have that ultimate trust in his family. He was following the goals of his father and not his family. So he was not following. Back then, an honorable family was a cohesive unit bound by trust and cooperation towards common goals. And if you had a family that was cohesive, and they all trusted one another, and they were all cooperating towards one common goal, then that family was held in honor. If a family was in disarray, then that family was shamed. And Jesus was breaking all of this. He wasn't following the family like he was supposed to. Jesus was actually doing the will of God even though it shamed his family. He was making a sacrifice. He was enduring shame and his family was experiencing shame because of what his father called him to do. That's a a difficult thing. But this is what he was doing. And the reason why he was doing this is because his identity, Jesus' identity was anchored in his heavenly father, so he was not swayed by his earthly family. He wasn't influenced or forced by their sense of honor and shame. Your Bible reading track for today is Luke 2, where Jesus is 12 years old and he's at the temple. It says, his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So his mother says, your father and I have been searching for you. And he says, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? They're talking about different fathers there. In verse 33 here, in what we just read, Jesus gives a very shocking answer here. He answered them, 
Who are my mother and my brothers? Who are they? Jesus is essentially disowning the family that saw his actions as shameful. Can you imagine saying that about your parents? Or imagine your kids saying that about you? Who is my mother or my brothers or my father, my sisters? Who? Who are you talking about? This is quite a shocking answer from Jesus here. He's saying, these are not my real mother and brothers. Look at the screen here. Let's answer this together. Why is he called God's only son when we also are God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God. Adopted by grace through Christ. So, Christ is the natural child of God. We, as believers, are the adopted children of God. We belong to the family of God. Verse 34, And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. By God's grace, believers in Jesus are part of a new family. We belong to this family, this heavenly family, where Christ is a brother and God is our Father. It says in John 1, To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then John, in his epistle, says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Children, part of the family, adopted. And this family, just like any earthly family, has a set of values. It has its own set of values, for that matter. Verse 35, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So this family has a different set of values. In John 5 verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. So if you love God, then you belong to this family, and you are going to love the people in this family. And then a couple verses later, For whoever who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Born of God. Even though we are not natural children of God, we are called born of God. We are part of this family. So, for us, like Jesus, grace means we do God's will even if the family thinks it's shameful. We follow the values of God's family even when it goes against our earthly family. The man here in the picture, his name is Nabil Karishi. He died not that long ago. He was a Muslim from a Muslim family and he became a Christian. And he wrote a biography about that whole experience. And he talks about having come from a family where there was a lot of honor and shame and then becoming a Christian. So he says this, the cost for a Muslim to accept the gospel can be tremendous. Of course, following Jesus meant that I would immediately be ostracized from my community. For all devout Muslims, it means sacrificing the friendships and social connections that they have built from childhood. It can mean being rejected by one's parents, siblings, spouse, and children. But I was not the only one who would have to pay for my decision. If there were traits my family was known for in the Muslim community, they were my parents' joyfulness, our close-knit relationships, and the honor we gathered by faithfully following Islam. My choice to follow Jesus meant raising all three. My decision would shame my family with incredible dishonor, Even if I were right about Jesus, could I do such a terrible thing to my family after everything they had done for me? 
Another part of the book, he says this, The honor-shame paradigm combined with the cost of following Jesus paralyzes many former Muslims into secrecy and deception. I have even met an immigrant in America who has been a Christian for more than two decades and still has not told his parents that he left Islam. Two decades. My counsel to all such new brothers and sisters in the faith is that they walk in the light and hide nothing. Jesus intends for us to walk openly and freely, whereas secrecy and deception are the domain of the devil. This is particularly important for Muslims from honor-shame contexts, as they are prone to hide difficult matters. It is only after we are unfettered by fear that we can live boldly as true Christians. Coming from an honor-shame context and having that family, by believing in Jesus, he was going to bring shame on his whole family. The family that loved him and raised him and cared for him. That was a very painful thing. And, but he says, I counsel all new brothers and sisters who grew up in a Muslim Islamic family that they hide nothing. That they do God's will even if the family thinks it's shameful. Grace transforms honor and shame. God's grace releases us from the slavery of family shame. There's a slavery to that. And he was feeling that, Nabil was. That he couldn't talk about Jesus. There was that burden that he carried. He couldn't talk about it. But God's grace releases us from that slavery where you can't talk about those things. God's grace gives us a new sense of honor and shame where we are no longer controlled by the shame of family secrets. Some of you, I may have, I think I mentioned this once before, but um, every, you know, every family has a secret. Some of them are many. Some families have fewer secrets. Um, in the Vriesman side, at least going back a little ways, uh, our family secret was alcohol. There were, I was told, four generations of alcoholics that were Friesmans. And uh, it wrecked the family. There were some that were even violent alcoholics. There were times when um, one, a dad would drive a son or a grandson and be swerving all across the road. Until the point where you can't, you can't drive the kid anymore. This is something that I didn't really know about until I was much older. We didn't talk about it. It was a source of shame for us. Now, we're starting to talk about it a little more. Because grace releases us from this shame. Because for Christians, sin no longer defines us, controls us, or condemns us. If you're a Christian, you are released from sin, and it no longer binds you, controls you, and it no longer condemns you. Grace means we seek healing from family sin. So, my grandma... And uh, my aunt and uncle and my parents and I, we were celebrating Grandma's birthday just this year, a couple months ago. And um, I was talking about this upcoming sermon series and how grace releases us from the burden of sin and the shame that goes with it. And as I was talking about this, suddenly everybody started to talk about the family shame. And stories were shared. And it was, this, this, it was like something just burst open. Or suddenly we could talk about it because when you remember that grace means that sin no longer condemns you, you are no longer a horrible person because you've committed a sin, then it no longer shames you. It no longer binds you. It no longer needs to be a secret. You can talk about it. 
You can talk about it. And you can talk about it with your children and say, hey, this is what I did and this is the consequences that I suffered because of it. And please don't repeat my mistakes. Grace means we expose family sin in order to heal from it. We can move on from it. In an honor-shame paradigm, it means, it, the focus is, it's okay unless you get caught. So as long as there's no shame, you didn't get caught, then fine. But that's not how God looks at it. Wherever there's sin, there's destruction. My grandpa was a medical doctor, and I remember him talking about when a wound gets infected and there's pus there, you have to extract that pus because a wound cannot heal if there is pus there. And so, just like that, we need to extract sin from our lives. As long as it's there, we cannot heal. Once we get it out, get it out in the open, we can heal. It really hurts to get it out. Wounds are painful, especially infected ones. But once you get it out, then healing can start. So I want to encourage you, don't hide your sins from your children. Don't hide them. Talk about them. Talk about the mistakes that you've made. Talk about the consequences that followed. You can even talk about the shame that you might feel because of it. Encourage your kids to not follow in those steps. Talk about sin's destructive power because it no longer shames you. It no longer condemns you. You don't have to be afraid of it. You are no longer enslaved to it. If cancer runs in your family, as it does in some families, then it's kind of important that your kids know about that, isn't it? You would want your kids to get regular checkups so that if cancer did come, that they would be able to discover it in time. If that's what we do with cancer, how much more should we do that with sin, which involves eternal realities and our relationship with God? Grace doesn't just mean exposing family sins, but it also means we forgive family sins too, which is really hard. But we are told from Colossians 3, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. You think about the story of Joseph, how he was sold into slavery by his brothers, and how awful that was, what a betrayal that was. And in the end, how Joseph actually forgave them for that. What an awful thing to forgive, but he did. The family that we claim as our family will determine the values that we have and the honor shame we live by. Every family has a set of values and a program of honor and shame to enforce those values. And the family that we belong to, that's the values that we will have and that's the honor and shame that we will live by. So who is your family? Who are, as Jesus said, who are your mother and your brothers? If your primary family is your earthly family, then you will find yourself hiding sin and faking honor. Because every family has its sins. Every family has its secrets. Every family has its shame. And if that is your primary family... You are going to find yourself hiding that sin and you are going to find yourself putting on a veneer of honor, trying to fake it, if that's your primary family. You're going to operate by that family's honor and shame. You're going to be perpetuating secrets and lies and you're going to be creating appearances. Jesus was talking to his fellow Jews in John chapter 8. And they claim, they said, we are offspring of Abraham. And we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? So they're claiming, 
an earthly family, Abraham. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If we are brought in and freed, and brought into a different family, then that sin no longer controls us. If they are children of Abraham, then they are slaves to sin. But if your primary family is God the Father and Christ as brother, then you will find yourself living by grace. You will operate by that family's values, that family's honor and shame. And you will no longer be bound by the sins that run in your family. They say that blood runs thicker than water, but the blood of Christ runs thicker than family. Who is your family? That's the question I want to leave you with today. Who is your family? Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to our Father. Lord God, our, our Father, our Heavenly Father, we look to you, Lord, because we are of this earth. We have earthly problems. We are bound in patterns of sin. Lord, we look to you for your grace so that we can be released from them, so that, Lord, we are no longer controlled by them, no longer shamed by them. We pray, Lord, that the world's systems of honor and shame would not control us or define us, but that, Lord, we would live by your grace, your values, and the honor that comes from belonging to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.